quantifying happiness. Is it like an oxymoron? What does it mean to be happy? Can we quantify our happiness? Five years ago, I was a scientist. I was finishing and writing up my PhD thesis and preparing for a career in research. Or not. During the nights I spent in the laboratory, watching the experiment, making sure all the data was collected properly, I had the privilege and the time to listen to that inner voice that we all have. That inner voice that Paulo Coelho, in his marvelous book, The Alchemist, calls the voice of the heart, the voice of the soul. The voice that whispers and reminds us of a, our personal legend. And I realized I was not fulfilling my personal legend. I was not happy. And so I decided to change, to take a break, maybe one, two years, to put some perspective and find out what I was really passionate about, what I was really into, what was my personal legend. And I started doing things that I was not used to. I started putting myself into situations that were new. And you don't necessarily have to go and live for months on a hut on top of a mountain with no running water to put yourself in a situation where you have some perspective. But you get what I'm talking about. I was not happy, and I started looking for happiness out of my comfort zone, doing things that I had not done before, like traveling, like learning to dance, like sleeping in a snow cave, in a hole that I dug, just for the sake of finding out how it felt, how it is to sleep in a snow cave. And I can tell you that was not one of the happiest moments in my life, because not far from the hole, the snowmobiles were grooming the tracks. And I was scared to death that it would just crush my hole and finish my search for happiness together with my hole prematurely. So another thing that I did was a course of meditation. And this is how it went. A friend of mine comes and says, hey, I've heard of this place where you go for 10 days. You're not allowed to speak to anybody. You eat very little, twice a day, just vegetables. You are set apart men from women. And you meditate from 4 a.m. in the morning till 10 a.m. in the evening. That's pretty much what you do. And I thought, hmm, sounds fun. I want to try it. <laughs> and you, you see how, what state I was in. Anyways, I go, and uh, here I am, doing my best to meditate. And I'm sitting in this Buddha-like position, very trying to concentrate, where my whole body is screaming and saying, why are you doing this? Why are you trying to stay still? It's really hard. I don't know if you've ever tried. It's really hard to stay still and think of nothing. And my mind is continuously distracted. It's like a monkey jumping from one thought to the other, jumping and changing subject, and I find it really hard to concentrate. And I realize that in the society we live in, it's really hard. It's really hard to focus and to listen. And that's because we are continuously bombarded by information. It's like having thousands of bells continuously ringing. It's my phone calling and an email and my social update and my status update and tweeting and, and you name it, brand calling. It's really hard to focus. It's really hard to listen. And yet, technology defines the world we live in. It's a very strong and powerful force. It's beyond the control of the individual. It's defining the choices that we have. It's defining what we can do, what we cannot do. And now, raise your hand if you've ever felt lost, if you've ever felt you're late 
with respect to innovation and technology. If you felt that things are moving too fast for you to cope with, for you to understand, if you felt like, I've just learned how this device works and their new one is out and it's totally different. And I felt like that. I felt old, outdated. And I think it's normal to feel like that. In an era where exponential technology is advancing so fast that new developments in fields that traditionally were separated, like robotics, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, are all converging and merging and shaping a, a new reality. And so what we are tempted to do is to reject this. Say it was better before. It was better when life was tougher, but simpler to understand. We are tempted to say technology is inherently evil or dangerous. And yes, there are dangerous technologies. There's lots of dangerous technology. But I think no one can deny that technology brings its, its own advantages. And it's better to live in a society where technology is available. So I'm here today to talk about a possible use of technology to enhance our lives, our mindfulness, our awareness. Raise your hand if you've heard what quantified self means. OK, some people get not going to be completely new. So quantified self is a movement that proposes the use of technology to support with data insights on how our body and our mind react to the solicitation of everyday life. And this is possible because sensors are becoming so tiny and so cheap that you can wear them. You can embed them in clothes, in devices that you carry on with you. And this is opening enormous and new possibilities that were not available even five years ago, ten years ago. To track what we do, what we feel, what we think, and understand better our life. Let me give you some examples. Start from the easy things. I can track my sports, my activity. I can wear a bracelet or a clip, go jogging, running, walking, cycling, swimming, and record how my body is interacting, how my body is doing. I can track my heartbeat, I can track my perspiration, my calories, my steps, and then enhance my training, basically speed up the way I learn a new discipline or the way I become better at doing it. But if I'm not a sport person, I can still take advantage of that, and I can do it without buying a new device, because my phone has enough technology inside my smartphone that I can use it as a quantified self-device. In fact, most of the smartphones have accelerometers inside, which are sensors that detect acceleration, and thus movement. And I can download an app, put the smartphone on my mattress before going to sleep, and what will happen is that it will record how I move during sleep. And recognize, detect, if I'm sound asleep, if I'm deeply sleeping, or if I'm in light sleep. And why is that interesting? Because it can then be tied to an alarm clock that will only wake me up when I'm in the light phase of sleep, so that I can feel refreshed and energized when I wake up, and not dead tired, as if I would feel if it, the alarm clock rang exactly in the middle of my deep sleep phase. The sensor would make it easier and better to live and wake up. Or at work, I can track my productivity, my mood, my stress, and thus find out what are the things that I can do better, that, I'm, that are easier for me to do, and what are the things that are not easy, what are the things that make me stressed. And let me give you a, a practical example, a personal example. So the other day, I was working, I was sitting at my desk, 
uh, working on the computer, and I was wearing one of these devices. Uh, this particular device tracks how I'm breathing. And that signal you see is, is me breathing uh, up and down. It's inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. And I'm focused. I'm working on my laptop. And something happens. I, I'm not really sure what happened in that moment. Maybe I received an email. Maybe I received uh, somebody calling me in the office. I, I'm sure I didn't move. But my breath rate changed. My breath became shallower and faster. So basically, I was stressed in that moment. I'm not sure why. But at some level, my body and my mind were aware of that. Because right after, I took a deep breath and I rebalance to normality, to a regular breathing. I think that's amazing. My body and my mind, without telling me, without making me aware of that, they know how to automatically react, how to automatically adapt to stressful situations. The problem is that my Autonomous and automatic responses, my instinct, has been shaped in a time that was really different from the time we live in now. Think of the primitive man. An external input often meant danger. Often meant you had a fraction of a second to react, either running away or getting ready to fight. And that's how our instinct evolved. We had to be ready very quickly. And so a sound or an external factor trigger a series of reactions inside us. And that's pretty much what we do today. Receive an email, receive a phone call, and ding, our ears, our whole body is set in motion. Our heartbeat becomes faster, our breathing becomes faster. We get ready to run away. As if there was a tiger outside, ready to eat us. There is no tiger, but yet our automatic response is triggered to react. And the question is, can we do better? Maybe, maybe we can. Maybe we can upgrade our instinct. We can upgrade our automatic response. We can learn how to auto autonomously and automatically react to this world, the world we live in today. And maybe technology can be an enabler, can be a door to doing that. Maybe wearable devices can be used to increase our awareness. For example, what if that day that I was sitting on my desk, working on my computer, I received an alert saying, hey, I noticed you're breathing faster. Maybe something that you're doing is causing you to stress. What about taking a deep breath? What about setting aside the task you're doing for a minute, just to rebalance? just to reconnect before you start doing it again. And yes, I promised to talk about happiness. And what I talked really about is awareness. And I know that awareness does not necessarily mean happiness, per se. But it can be the starting point. Using wearable technology, to know better how your body and mind react to the world, to know what are the things that make you feel well, and what are the things that don't make you feel well, can be the starting point to go towards that happiness that we all deserve, and that we all want. It's like having a map that traces the direction in which I want to go. 
Now, the only thing that is separating me from achieving my goal, my happiness, is to walk the walk. And this would be the subject of entirely new talk, so I'm not going to talk about it today. But I will leave you with a question. If you know the direction, if you knew the direction in which you have to or you want to go, what are you waiting to jump? Thank you very much.